My name is Neil Bacon, and I am a violinist with the Lake Washington Symphony Orchestra, and I'm here to tell you all about the violin, which, as you can see, it's a beautiful wooden instrument. Um, it hasn't changed much in the last 400 years. It's held together with animal hide glue. Um, I don't know if there's a vegan version, but uh, perhaps they're working on that. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it's got four strings, as you can see. They pass over a curved bridge. Um, and maybe you can think about why it's curved. Um, and strings are tuned in fifths to G, D, A, and E. And basically they make sound like this. Oh, excuse me a minute. I'm getting a message from my producer. Don't forget the bow. Ah, it's important to present yourself nicely. Thank you very much. Uh, I had another message coming in. The wooden thing with the hair. Hmm. I've been called a lot of things in my life. But, oh, I know what they mean. They mean the bow. OK, um, happily, I happen to bring one with me. Here we have the bow, which is, as you can see, it's a wooden thing with the hair. Um, so the, the wood is a special kind of wood. It's usually from Brazil. It's a kind of wood called Pernambuco from an area of Brazil called, would you believe it, Pernambuco. And it's strung with horsehair, which comes from the tail of a horse. And um, again, a tradition going back at least 400 years. And um, with all of the modern changes you've seen to tennis rackets and other equipment, you'd, be, you'd have thought they would have found something by now. But apparently not. Horsehair is still the best material. And so, um, so, and so we can now talk about uh, a little bit about how the bow works. So the bow has its um, inherent springiness, which comes from the wood and also from the hair. And you can make a very different kind of sound when you use the bow together with the violin, because really they're two instruments that work together. So you heard the plucking. And we, when we have the bow, you can do things like this. That's a kind of a technique we call a ricochet, which is where the bow is bouncing all on its own. That's one of the fun things that you can do with the bow. Um, and another property the bow has, which you can't get with plucking, is, is you can make very long lines and, and beautiful phrases. So you can play something like um, in Beethoven's second romance, for example, you can play uh, this kind of thing. kind of sound that you can't possibly get with, with, without a bow. Um, so the bow gives you the ability to give you little crescendos and smooth lines and different kinds of phrasing. Um, so the violin and bow together, it's a happy marriage, and it uh, gives you all sorts of chances to personalize your sound. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, why you might want to choose the violin over other instruments. So, so first of all, um, apart from being fun to play, um, it's also a portable instrument. You can carry it around with you. Um, I, I once put my violin on the back of my, my bicycle and rode around Ireland and learned fiddle tunes, and it just had a lot of fun. Um, it's much, much harder to do that with a piano. Uh, it's also an instrument where you'll make a lot of friends. It's a, it's a very social instrument. If you look at the school orchestra, you'll, you'll notice that there might be 30 or more violins there and maybe one or two flutes. So if you're in the orchestra as a violinist, that's uh, 29 potential friends you could make there. Um, it's also, th th there's so much music that you can play with the violin. You can play in string quartets with a, with a small group of friends. You can play in symphony orchestras. You can play fiddle tunes. You'll see the violin in music throughout the world. It'll be used in Mexican music and Egyptian music and Irish music. And so you've got so many chances to, to explore your world with the violin. Um, it's also an instrument where, um, as I was saying earlier, you can, you can personalize it. So um, every violin feels a little different to, to the others. They're shaped differently. They make a different kind of sound. 
Um, you've got choices in terms of how you string it up. And so, so my personal introduction to the violin came just hearing people playing fiddle tunes a, a, around my family. And I, I still remember one of them was called Drowsy Maggie. I later learned it. It goes like this. That's a bit of Drowsy Maggie. And so well, I thought, that's kind of cool. I'd like to learn how to play that. And I also loved listening to recordings of violinists playing their, you know, the famous violin concertos. And I realized, hey, there's an instrument where I can, where I can do both. I don't have to choose. So, so that, that, that was an initial uh, inspiration for me. And also at the time, I was playing a little bit of a different instrument called the five-string banjo, which I'll show you just a little bit of. Here we have the five-string banjo. So I started on this, and, and, and playing the five-string banjo, I learned a little bit of how, how the notes are, are oriented. So you can notice on the banjo, one big difference is it's got frets. So that tells you where to put your finger. So if I want to play this note, for example, I can put it somewhere between these two frets. And that gives me this note. And if I go one down, that's a semitone down. That's, that's one half step, which is, if you look at the piano, those are two keys that are right next to each other. So, um, so it's, it's a very easy instrument to, in terms of learning where those things are. And so you can play a little tune, for example, um, this is called Old, Old Joe Clark. So before I discovered the violin and tunes like Drowsy Maggie, I actually learned a few tunes on the five-string banjo that my father taught me. So here we have a five-string banjo. It's a very interesting instrument with a fascinating history that you can look up. Um, it originated in Africa. And um, it's, a, it's an instrument that's, well, OK, let's be honest. It's easier to play than the violin. And it's also an easy instrument to learn rhythm because you, you can basically strum it. And you've, and you've kind of got your one, two, and three, four, and rhythm there for free. Um, plucking this fifth string, which is basically a drone string. We never actually stop that one. And then if you get a little fancier, you can pluck down on the strings, and then that's a technique called the claw hammer. A little bit rusty on the, on the banjo, but um, anyway, so that's called double thumbing. And that's about the extent of my banjo knowledge. Um, I don't play it very often, but I do love the sound that it makes. And as I say, it was kind of an introduction to the violin for me. Um, because when I looked at the violin, I, my first thought was, where are the frets? How do I know where to put my fingers? And so we can talk a little bit about that now. So back on the violin now, after that little uh, banjo and interlude, as I was saying, my first thought was, hmm, that's an interesting looking instrument. I wonder how they play it, and I wonder how they know where to put their fingers, because I'm used to frets. So why doesn't the violin have frets? So. Well, one reason is it's a lot smaller than the banjo, and, and so um, you'd have to make the frets actually very close together, especially by the time you're up at the top of the instrument. So, so the whole range of the violin is approximately four octaves from the bottom G. So if we play arpeggios from there. That's the first octave. That's the second. That's the third. That's the fourth. And by the time you're up there, the, the distance between those two notes is, is uh, it's even less than the width of your finger. So just by rocking your finger, you can get a different note. Um, so we don't spend all that much time really that high up on, on the instrument. But most of the time, we'll be down, down here in what we call first position. Um, and in first position, um, very conveniently, the notes are approximately one finger width apart. So for most people, if you just put your fingers touching, you're going to be quite close to, uh, to that semitone. I don't know if you can see it. So in that tune I started on the banjo, old Joe Clark, 
that second interval. Between those two, that's about a finger's width. And then if you want a whole tone, well, you just double that, which sounds easy, doesn't it? Um, but it take, takes a bit of practice to, to get it right. Um, and you can, um, there are some tricks that you can use to, to help you find the note on the instrument. Um, one is to use the open strings. So the open string should be in tune, and then when you put your finger down, I can use the open strings. Does that ring? That sounds pretty good. That should be an octave. And that should be the same note. So, so that, that's one cheat you can do. The, the other thing is if your finger is in the right place, if you lift it slightly, you'll get a ringing sound that we call... And that's called a harmonic. So if, if you're not sure your finger is in the right place, you can, you can try that trick. And, and, and that'll help train your fingers um, as to where to put them. Now, another thing you can do is as you go higher up on the instrument, if you found your note here, for example, or here, I can replace that finger with a different finger. It's called substitution. So just by swapping one finger for another, I, I can crawl my way up the instrument and know where I am. Um, so there's a few tricks you can, you can play there with the violin. And you, maybe by now you've guessed why the bridge is curved. It helps me play just one string at a time without touching the others. If I want to, I can play two together. And if I press, press really hard, I can actually play three together. Um, and so and in, inside the violin, you may or may not be able to see that there's, there's this post here. The French call it the heart. Um, here we call it the sound post. And, and, and that connects the, the plates on the top and, and, and the back and helps the instrument um, resonate. But all in all, it's, it's a beautiful piece of craftsmanship. And it's, uh, it's an instrument that I think you can, uh, over the years, you, you, you'll, you'll sort of grow with it. So another, another thing you might notice on the violin is, um, is, is this little gizmo here, which is called a mute. Um, now, this, is, uh, this has the effect. It's not quite like the mute on, in your Zoom call, where, where you can make somebody go completely silent. Um, but it, it changes the, the sound of the violin. So if we hear, if we hear without the mute, you, you've, you've got. And you put the mute on, it makes this kind of sound. And that was a sound that. That Tchaikovsky absolutely loved to use it in his violin concerto in the slow movement. You can. It's a very peaceful kind of sound. He also used it in his. Uh, First string quartet, uh, which I was playing recently with some friends. Um. That's the kind of sound you get with the mute. Um, there, there are other ways you can turn the, the violins. Uh, lack of frets in, into, to your advantage um, with this technique called um, portamento, and where you, you can sort of slide from one note to the next. And then when you get there, you can you wobble your finger around and make this vibrato sound. Um, and, and then there's a special effect you can do in non-vibrato. Um, we also have a lot of range of colors we can get on the violin depending on where we put the bow and how, how hard we press. So if we put it very close to the bridge, we, we can get a special effect there that's called uh, sul ponticello, which is, is Italian for on the bridge. Whereas if you play down here, you get more of a sort of a muted sound down around over the fingerboard. This is the fingerboard, by the way. Um, so, so we can hear those in... Um, I'll just give a little example from a piece by uh, Monty. This is called Chardas. Mm -hmm. 
You can hear that this this kind of sound. It's it's almost imitating another instrument called the zither, which they play in Hungary. It's got a um, a double stop passage. So double stopping is where we play two strings at the same time, like that. And, and you probably heard in there the harmonic. So th that kind of harmonic where you're high up, that's a nice trick because um, if, if you miss it slightly, well, it just doesn't sound. Whereas if you hit it, you've hit the jackpot. So it's a little bit like buying a lottery ticket. If, uh, you know, if, if you win, then everybody hears it, hears about it. If, and if you lose, then it's, it's OK. Nobody, you, you just, it's just not news anymore. So, um, so that's a nice trick. And then. Um, Another thing he uses in another section is a special kind of harmonic where you're actually putting one finger down fully and the other finger down just lightly. And, and that creates uh, what we call a false harmonic. Um, so th th those are just a few of the special effects that, that we can get on, on the violin, and there are many others. Um, you can bounce the bow around, as we were talking earlier on, um, ricocheting. If you can ricochet across three strings, that's kind of a fun effect. And so on. So why would you choose the violin as an instrument? Well, I know from my personal experience and, and from others, um, I know that I've made a lot of friends through playing the violin, and it's, it's an instrument that's a very social instrument. Um, it's an instrument where, where you can really personalize it in ways that I don't know if it's possible with other instruments. Um, just just the, the, the way that, that, that your hand falls on the fingerboard, the kind of pressure you use, the sort of vibrato you use, the, the way you hold the bow. Um, and it, it, it's really an instrument where you're, I think you can discover yourself and, and other people through it. Um, I know a lot of people are afraid of the violin and they think, oh, it's so funny to hold, hold it in this funny position. And, and Okay, it takes a bit of getting used to, but it's basically all you're doing is, if you want to play the violin, yes, you nod. So you nod on the violin, that's all you do to hold it. And, and you don't have to hold it hard. And, and, and similarly with, with the bow, the bow hold is just, if you just relax your hand, that's basically the bow hold. And similarly with the left hand, it's just bring it around here, that, that's the position. So it, it need, needn't be too hard. Um, but of course, it takes a bit of practice, and practice makes permanent, as they say. But I, I strongly encourage you to take that leap and give it a go. So I, I hope you've enjoyed my little presentation, and I hope it's helped you make your decisions in terms of where to go on your musical journey. And I do hope you include the violin on that. And um, so I'll conclude by saying happy fiddling. And uh, don't forget the bow, and don't forget the bow. Thank you.